In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today is going to be from the book of Samuel again. We are continuing our series there. And Israel has been battling the Philistines at this point. They're already going back and forth with them. And, and really, I say that, but there's not a whole lot of back and forth going on. God has basically already delivered the Philistines into their hands. They've already won the victory. The Philistines are on the run. Israel is just going in and pursuing the fleeing Philistine army and spoiling them and, and taking the spoils of war, uh, things like livestock, cattle, gold, that sort of thing. And so this is taking place. And while all this is going on, you may recall this has been the subject of the past several chaplain's reports looking at this passage of Scripture, that Prince Jonathan is running through the woods there, and he comes across some wild honey, and he partakes of it, which normally wouldn't be a big deal, except even though Jonathan didn't know this at the time, because he was off doing something else when all of this happened. His father, King Saul, had declared that any man that partakes of food, any man in his army that eats before sundown, that that person is, I think he, the exact wording is, let him be accursed or something like that. Basically, he says that everybody, uh, I'm going to take this oath and we're all going to go on a fasting until this. And, and Jonathan has some words to say about that. You can check that out in the chaplain's report, I believe, from last Tuesday, if you want to check that out on my YouTube channel. But Jonathan did partake of this honey, not knowing that his father had declared this, and then a little bit later on, where Saul sees that God has not given him an answer for his question through the prophets and the priests that are there traveling with them, that he says, well, what this must mean is that somebody has broken this oath. And by the way, Saul is right. He doesn't know that it's Jonathan, but he says, whoever has broken this oath will die, even if it is my son Jonathan. Again, he says this not knowing that his son was actually the one that did indeed break this oath. And so that results in this exchange that we're going to be looking at tonight from 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 43 through 45. Then Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what you have done. So Jonathan told him and said, in, I indeed tasted a little honey at the end of the staff that was in my hand. Here I am, I must die. Saul said, May God do this to me, and more also to you, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. But the people said to Saul, Must Jonathan die, who has brought about this great deliverance in Israel? Far from it. As the Lord lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan, and he did not die. This is a really fascinating piece of scripture, because... When you look at part of having a king being a bad idea, and part of the reason that God didn't want people to have a king, is because a human being does not need to have that much absolute power. A human being cannot possibly handle the responsibility because he's a flawed human being. They cannot adequately handle the responsibility that comes with having that kind of absolute power over other people's lives. And this is a perfect example of why it's a bad idea. Saul, in his own ignorance, because he's an imperfect human, he's not God, he made a very foolish vow. A vow that, in this case, Jonathan didn't even know about and violated, even though he didn't know that that was the case. This is the reason that you don't have human beings with this much authority over another person's life, and yet, it happened. And so Saul makes this very foolish vow, which is a stupid idea. He makes it in haste. It's basically a whim, a spur of the moment thing that he just decides at the last second, okay, this is what we're going to do from this point on, and then enforces it because he is the king. He has the power to do that. And this is an illustration of why a human being shouldn't have that kind of authority. But nonetheless, this is what happens 
And I think that this really does illustrate the principle to us, even though we don't have this kind of absolute power that Saul had over other people. But this is a truism regardless of what our position in life is. Never make a promise you don't intend to back up. Don't say foolish things just on the spur of the moment or for emphasis or whatever. If you say something, you need to be able to back it up. See, Saul here makes a promise that he doesn't think he's ever going to have to keep. First, he makes the promise with the oath and saying that nobody is going to taste any food, which is, again, a foolish thing, a ridiculous thing to say, because then your entire plan can be screwed up by one random person saying, oh, look, some wild berries over there. Okay, I'll just go ahead and take those, and, and I don't care what Saul says. But it could also be done by somebody that didn't even know that. It could be ruined by somebody that's just forgetful and takes a bite of something, not even remembering that that was to take place. And so the whole episode, Saul does something very, very foolish here. And then to try to make his point, he enforces a law that was not God's, that was something that he commanded and does so and says, even the person that does this is going to die, even if it's my only son, not realizing that actually had taken place. And so Saul in this episode is an awful lot of talk and bluster and then it comes time that he has to back it up. And, and I guess to his credit, even though this was a dumb thing to do, to his credit, he at least is trying to showcase some integrity and some impartiality saying, well, I said it, so now we have to do it. I will grant Saul a little grace in that area, but the overall, the decision-making process and the way that he chose his words were not a good godly way to govern. But if Saul ever had a defining trait, and I, by the way, I do find this hilarious that we just got done with John, talking about John Roberts in our Daily Dose of Stupid. I didn't plan this. This is part of an ongoing series. But Saul seems to have the same problem that Justice John Roberts does, which is basically all of his decisions are dictated by what the public thinks. Saul cares way too much about what people think. And usually when it comes a, down to a question of Saul doing the right thing, or what the public thinks he should do, he almost always goes with what the public thinks he should do, regardless of what the right thing to do is. He will straight up defy God's law in order to protect public opinion. He does this multiple times in the scripture. And he does it right here, too. Remember that in Saul's own mind, the right thing to do would be to execute his son for breaking his oath. But public opinion suddenly changed and dictated that he not do that, so he went with public opinion. So Saul winds up doing the right thing and not killing Jonathan, but in his mind, it wasn't the right thing to do. It was what public opinion dictated that he ought to do. That's the problem with Saul. That's basically how he makes all of his decisions, it's just in this particular case, public opinion happened to be right. This is part of the problem that I have, and I don't want to go off way into politics, but this is part of the problem that I have with the doctrine of populism, that you basically just go with whatever the crowd thinks, because the crowd very often gets it wrong. This is an occasion where the crowd got it right. This is an occasion where the crowd, what they decided was actually the correct conclusion to come to, but not always. In fact, more often than not, public opinion, and this is especially true if you understand your biblical history, more times than not, the people are going to decide the opposite of what God would want them to decide, unfortunately. But it's interesting because the law of God actually has a provision for something like this. God understood that human beings are impetuous and impulsive and say crazy and wild things to make a point, like, Saul does here, and because of that, there actually is a provision that takes place in Leviticus 27 in the Law of Moses that explains that a foolish vow can be undone with an offering. And I believe for a male over the age of 26, again, sort of leading to the idea that young people tend to make really dumb decisions, and a grown man like Saul ought to know better, but I believe it's any man over the age of 26 has to give up 50 shekels to the priest, and so that is the payment that he makes for a bad vow. You're not supposed to go through with the vow. You're supposed to give an offering and ask for forgiveness for making that foolish vow. This is, by any reasonable person's definition, a very foolish thing for Saul to do. And so if Saul knew God's word, if he knew 
the words of God, the law of Moses, and knew it better, he would know that this isn't a decision that he has to make. All he has to do is make an offering to ask God's forgiveness for making the dumb vow in the first place, not follow through on your own stupidity. And so had he known God's, God's law, he would have avoided this altogether, which I think is a very powerful statement for us. That sometimes just knowing God's law will get us out of the jam before we even get into the jam. It provides a scriptural way of escape a way to understand what we're actually doing and having that wisdom and insight at our disposal at a moment's notice will help us in our decision-making process just like it would have helped Saul here. But ultimately, what this story does illustrate and illustrate very powerfully is that words do matter. That God does take what we say seriously. And because our words do matter, it is incumbent upon us to use them wisely and to use them in a way that God would approve. Stay the course, friends. So now they have this fancy new technology where you click on one of these boxes and it takes you to another one of my videos. Hopefully it works a lot better than the Obamacare website or the DNC's Iowa caucus app. Gotta love that big government central planning.